morning. Hello. I've never been the first one on this meeting before. Welcome everyone. We'll give folks another couple minutes to join. Welcome folks, we're just giving everyone a couple more minutes to join. Um, we'll give folks another 30 seconds. I'm uh, trying to give folks the permission to edit their names so they can add uh, more detail, uh, but I just have to remember how to do it. If anyone knows and wants to like give me a quick direction, I'll take it. Eric, I was just able to do it <laughs> successfully. I don't know if I have special status, but I just right clicked on my face and it gave me the redeem option. Um, I think uh, that's because you were host, Jenny, and I just stole your host ship. So I'm trying to. Eric, if out. you go to uh, the security setting that you probably uh, have at the yeah. bottom. You can yep. check, re, um, allow participants to rename. Done, thank you, Henry. Thank you for making that change, Eric. 
Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Kathy Killing Del Rio. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I work with Maine Equal Justice and I'm also chair of this Maine Care Advisory Committee. Um, I know we have a few new folks today. So just quickly, um, we usually start with introductions and ask folks to share their name, pronouns, and the organization they're with, or um, what brings them to this meeting today if they're not representing an organization. And um, we usually start by me going through the existing list of MAC members and alternates, and then um, have main care folks introduce themselves and then come back to um, anybody who's here as a guest. So I'm gonna go ahead and go through that list. And I think we might be having some changes to this list later in this morning, but for now, I'm gonna use the list I have um, and start with Esther Miller. Good morning, Esther Miller, Main Care Program Manager with the Office for Family Independence, managing eligibility for Main Care. Thank you, uh, Laura Cordes. Good morning, Laura Cordes with the Maine Association for Community Service Providers, Maxby, she, her, hers. Jamie Cottonwar. Good morning, Jamie Cottonwar, Associate Director for the Division of Disease Prevention at the Maine Center for Disease Control. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Uh, Kathy Dion. Good morning, Kathy Dion, uh, Executive Director for the Autism Society of Maine, and I use she, her, hers. Gia Drew. Good morning, Gia Drew, Executive Director at Equality Maine, she, her, hers. Al Durgan. Good morning, Al Durgan, Sproing Services. I use he, him, his. Rachel Dyer. Leo Delicata. Good morning, um, Leo Delicata, Legal Services for the Elderly. Uh, I'm an attorney and I use he, him pronouns. Mark Eaves. Good morning, Mark Eaves, Executive Director of Woodbridge Family Services and I use he, him, hips pro pronouns. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mike Hollenbeck. Candy Henderly. Good morning, Candy Henderly, she, hers. I'm the Director of Health for the Penobscot Nation. Jillian Dolliker. Jillian Dolliker, assistant slash she, her pronouns. Beth Pierce. Beth Pierce uh, with the main um, primary care association and I am the oral health program manager and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Sarah Lewis. Sarah Lewis with Maine Access Immigrant Network in Portland. She, her, hers. Jim Martin. Vicki McCarty. Good morning. Vicki McCarty here uh, from the Consumer Council System of Maine, which is an organization made up of uh, all folks who have mental health issues, and we do public policy and legislative work. Thank you. Atlee Riley. Oh, Sarah Squire might be here for Atlee. Yeah, hi, Sarah Squire, Public Policy Director for Disability Rights, Maine, and I use she, her, her pronouns. Uh, Dee Sabatis. Rachel Collimore. Good morning, Rachel Collimore. Um, from Consumers for Affordable Healthcare, I use she, her, hers pronouns. Suzanne Farley. Or Mallory Shaughnessy. Hi. Good, oh. Oh, sorry. Good morning. It's Mallory Shaughnessy with the Alliance for Addiction and Mental Health Services. I use she, her, hers. Thanks. And for those who are new, Mallory is the vice chair of the MAC. Um, Jeff Tyner. Morning, everyone. Jeff Tyner from Catholic Charities. Susan White or Lori Belden. David Winslow. Good morning, David Winslow with the Maine Hospital Association. 
great. Um, I'll pass it over to main care. Um, and sorry, Michelle, I see you, I think in the conference room, okay. Good morning, Michelle Probert. I use she, her pronouns, main care director, Mandy. Hi, I'm Amanda Lee, rate setting coordinator for main care. I use the she, her pronouns. I'll, I'll take from there. Um, Eric Isley, uh, he, him, and his, and I'm the director of communications for main care. I'll pass to Jenny Patterson. Hi, everyone. Jenny Patterson. I'm the director of policy for the Office of Main Care Services. And I use she, her pronouns, and I will turn to Lisa Weaver. Morning, everyone. Lisa Weaver with the uh, policy unit of the Office of Main Care Services, she, her, hers. And um, Henry Eckerson. Hi, everyone. I'm Henry Eckerson. I'm a policy writer in the Office of Main Care Services. And I'm not sure if there is another OMS person who I should be calling on. Oh, I think Molly. Molly is on. Yeah, I can yeah. go next. Hi, all. Um, Molly Slotsnick, she, her, hers, chief operating officer. And I'll go to Tia. Well, good morning. I'm. Can you hear me okay? Making sure. Yes. I'm Tia. I am a provider relations at Office of Main Care Services, and I use she and her. Thank you. Is there anyone else from OMS? Any other MAC members or alternates who I missed? Hi, Kathy. Good morning. It's Jim Martin. Uh, he, him, his from Sweetser. Great. Uh, Regina Phillips from Cross Cultural Community Services, pronoun she, her. Thank you. Um, any other guests? You can either take yourself off mute or and introduce yourselves or put your information um, in the chat. Okay, I'm not hearing anybody else come off mute, so I'm going to assume folks are going to put it in the chat um, and we'll jump into the rest of our agenda, um, which is updates from main care. Michelle. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, so I have a relatively small number of updates that don't fall into policy making or um, rate reform. Um, first, uh, just as a reminder to folks that uh, November 11th is uh, the day where we anticipate um, that if the public health emergency is going to end uh, on January 11th, that we would hear by November 11th. Um, if we don't hear anything, uh, then the understanding um, per the commitments that the federal government has made, uh, the understanding is that the public health emergency um, would be extended yet again once we get to January. So as a department, and I think um, uh, as uh, it probably had the same comment with many, if not all other states around the country, we have been proceeding um, with uh, as though the public health emergency is going to end in January, uh, but we will know by our last, MAC, by our next MAC meeting, uh, whether that is the case. We will know before that as well. And we usually send out um, uh, that information if anything comes out uh, officially um, in writing. Uh, all right. Um, I also wanted to share again, I think I made this update last time, but our Primary Care Plus or PC Plus application is open right now. So uh, for primary care practices that did not apply um, this spring, summer, or uh, that applied, but um, think that they may qualify for a new tier, uh, that application process is open until November 11th, um, and we encourage you to apply. Uh, I also wanted to let folks know, um, and these are all in our e-messages if you'd like more information, but uh, the department as a whole is uh, holding, um, I might not get this name, precisely right, but uh, strategic planning sessions around uh, the department's behavioral health plan. Uh, we had the first of, I 
think for um, public sessions last Friday, and there is another one coming up this week um, with great participation last Friday. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, please participate. There's been robust conversation, or there was as part of that last meeting. Um, and I think I've also mentioned this before, but want to flag that uh, we are conducting uh, bi-monthly stakeholder meetings on certified community behavioral health clinics. Uh, the next scheduled meeting is on November 28th. I know that's close to Thanksgiving, um, uh, but if you are interested in that, um, FYI. Um, and Molly, I also have on my list the update about the uh, attending provider claims issue, but I will let you give that update um, since you know about it better than I do. Sure. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so I have two things that I have uh, discussed both before in this venue, but I'll just keep reminding people of them. So. Uh, we've talked before about a federally mandated requirement that institutional claims need to have an attending provider type one and attending provider NPI on the claim. Uh, we have, um, be because uh, we have not seen providers do this with enough frequency that we would have expected, we have pushed out the deadline for this a couple times. Uh, we did send another message recently that we are, are pushing out the deadline again to April 1st, 2023. Uh, that is a long time from now. Uh, we picked that deadline because Medicare is also going to be enforcing the same requirement on that deadline. Uh, and um, so that, that's how we picked it. And even though it is pretty far from now, providers should not stop um, working towards compliance. Uh, if you have any questions or if you know anyone who has any questions, please have them reach out to their provider relations specialist. We've been in touch directly with many providers about this. Um, again, we've, we've sent out a number of e-messages over the last year and a half on this topic, uh, but please reach out to provider relations or provider services if you have any questions and please keep working towards compliance on that. Um, and then the other, the other recurring reminder is that uh, we are going live with electronic visit verification requirements for home health and hospice January 1, 2023. We are in the soft launch period right now. Uh, I don't see Laurie on today. Uh, she and I have been in touch about this, but uh, we are still seeing that a number of providers um, have a little bit of work to do to, uh, to, to come into compliance and, and get their, their visit records in. Um, so again, please reach out. Um, if you or anyone you know has any uh, any questions about the requirements or or getting started or implementing uh, electronic visit verification, thank you. Thanks, Molly. And I'll just note on the attending provider requirement on claims, uh, I will say that we uh, did start to see some more promising uptick in compliance as we were getting close to the October thirty first um, uh, last deadline. Um, but that there's still absolutely room for improvement. Um, uh, some of you are aware that we were particularly concerned um, uh, about a number of PNMIs, uh, where in you know, some cases facilities, 100% of their claims would, uh, if, if we were, uh, if we had implemented uh, non-payment, um, then they would not be getting any payment, which obviously is a great concern. And so thanks for assistance from some folks on this call, as well as from our provider relations team. Uh, to really try and OBH and OCFS are also helping out to make sure that there is awareness and our PR team can get into very provider and claim specific information to make sure that folks understand what needs to happen. Um, uh, uh, David, um, I will uh, note that from a percentage compliance standpoint, the hospitals are doing much better than uh, some of the performance we saw for some PNMIs, but um, there was still some significant dollar amounts. And again, we were uh, for some providers. And so you and I can connect if uh, you want to see our latest data on, on that front. But it's absolutely trending in the right direction. That'd be great. Thank you. All right. Kathy, I think that's uh, that's it for main care updates. Um, you, I think, probably shared an update about this last time, and I'm just totally forgetting, but several months ago, there was conversation here about the um, requirement that um, 
providers needed to be in prescribers needed to be enrolled in main care for prescriptions to be covered. And originally that was supposed to roll out in September and it was going to get delayed. <clears throat> Can you share what the updated date for that is? Because I feel like for some reason I don't have it. I um, don't have it off the top. Um, I can see if I can get that for you. Um, I have been checking in with our pharmacy director, Anne-Marie Tatarico, and know that we she's uh, taken a number of steps to try to understand like where the biggest problems are in that area. I know one thing she mentioned is that there are actually a number of nursing facilities where this comes up as an issue. And so she's been working with ODES and doing outreach on that front. Um, I will ask her whether she's set a new compliance date. Uh, we've talked about, you know, the fact that we want to see progress um, uh, because we, we don't want to um, leave members without uh, needed prescription. So, um, we both need to comply with this. That absolutely is an issue uh, that uh, we need to fix. But at the same time, we don't want to um, put people's health at risk. Uh, so I'll see if she has a, um, a new date at this point or not, um, or when she anticipates having one. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so our next agenda item is about MAC membership appointments. And I believe Eric, you're leading that. Yeah, um, this is kind of going to be a joint uh, Eric and Michelle uh, conversation, but the we have been working on the MAC has a number of um, membership requirements, um, and most of those are around having some member representation and some um, and some clinical representation. The, those are things that we have. Uh, not, success, not successfully met in recent times. Um, and we have been working on the main care side um, to identify um, members who are interested and willing to be, serve as, um, uh, uh, to serve as representatives on the main care advisory committee and um, clinical practitioners who are willing to serve. Um, in addition to that, you know, there's um, there's some uh, additional categories of uh, representation that are expected. There's certain state positions. Um, there's tribal uh, representation. Those sorts of things. Um, and Michelle and I have been spending since um, Michelle and I, with support of Kathy, uh, have been working on. Um, the next round of appointments. And we realize they're a little bit delayed right now um, that you all, Kathy has checked in to see if folks are interested and willing to serve another term. Um, and in our, we are, we're working to figure out how to make the, make sure we have the required appointments covered um, and how to continue our shift towards member focus um, as the MAC. Um, and so I am working to get a, a conversation with Kathy and with Mallory, the new chair and vice chair to kind of talk through some of these uh, points. And we just wanted to kind of flag that the next round of appointments are due, overdue, um, and that we are working on them, but with this member focused um, and required, uh, you know, required MAC membership representation focused approach. Um, so there may be some changes as we, as we move forward and identify folks who are gonna, who are gonna fit those member focused roles. Um, Michelle, is there more you wanna say on that? I think you've covered it, Eric. I mean, I'll just say a little bit more explicitly what I think um, there's awareness of, which is that um, uh, a lot of our content of our meetings right now uh, ends up being strongly, um, oftentimes a strong provider bet, right? Uh, I think a parallel effort right now is to be transitioning more of the conversation around rate determinations and rate reform to the rate reform subcommittee. We will still have updates in this meeting. 
Um, but I, I think that transition uh, should help us to have a, a, a broader focus, um, both incorporating a clinical perspective, which is, um, as Eric noted, a federal requirement and has not been uh, much of a focus of this group, um, as well as uh, making sure that um, we're really thinking from a member focus perspective. Um, so uh, we'll be getting more explicit, obviously, but just trying to make sure that we have an appropriate balance in terms of membership. Um, I will also note that uh, these meetings are, are public. Uh, a, a number of you uh, regularly attend, um, even if you're not members, and that is obviously not going to, to change. Um, uh, but we do want to think about the um, intent of the group when we look at a balance of who is an official NAC member. So more to come, but we just wanted to raise the general topic and give a heads up right now. Kathy, you got a hand up. Did you have something connected to this? Yeah, I think, you know, and I, I know that the intent, because I've been on the mat for a long time, was for the members to have their voice heard and to understand how services are. But a lot of the times these meetings are so in depth with um, things that wouldn't be at a, uh, an understanding level for them at all. So if we want to engage and have more of member, MAC members, we need to remember that and, and, and allow for us to not talk in these acronyms that we do, because a lot of the times they, they, they don't know what we're referencing. They don't know what we're really talking about. How does that affect them? And, and I think we need to put it in more of those terms. Yeah, Kathy, that's so um, it is not directly connected to the appointments for for the MAC, but um, we are in the process of hiring a member engagement manager. Hmm. Um, and part of the aim of that role is to put together a member board that will kind of address some of those concerns and and help us um, help us gain support member voice in a way that's inclusive, right? Like not in a way that that can be alienating because you know, provider and and clinical feedback is also important, um, but it's a different language sometimes. Um, we have definitely we have a, a member who is uh, who is interested in serving as a as a MAC member, and we've done a lot to kind of prep um, that reality, uh, and and the member is very much on board. But what you're describing as a need is something we recognize and that um, we should have staffing to support uh, a member engagement. And, and, you know, the conversation of whether that's a subcommittee of the MAC um, is something that, you know, we're, we're definitely talking with between main care and with um, the, the chair of the MAC um, trying to think through how to do this. Um, and Sana raises a great point. Um, that members uh, don't necessarily have free time at 10 on a Tuesday. Um, and that's real. And any, any real member engagement um, strategy is going to have to take that into account. And um, I think that's where the member engagement manager position um, and that member focused board would probably have to take a different approach than a middle of the weekday. So Sana, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, I think it falls right in line with Kathy's point. I appreciate both those points um, because obviously the MAC makeup and membership is just one component of this broader picture. And to Kathy's point, like how we structure these meetings and what we talk about and how we talk about things uh, is critical. Uh, the logistics to, to make sure that it's a friendly time is critical. Um, and uh, as Eric said, you know, we, we know that some other states have had um, some success with uh, having a group that's really explicitly uh, members um, and then having a connection between that group and the MAC in a way that could potentially, frankly, be friendlier um, and uh, make sure that um, folks feel like uh, they are getting value and meaning from the conversation and that they're also having an impact at the um, I don't know, Kathy, you can, you can slap my hand if you want to move on to the next thing, just as we're trying to keep time. But um, Dan raises a point in the chat about this time for providers. 
uh, and whether after hours has ever been discussed. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's, I don't think there's a good time to have a meeting like this for everybody ever, right? Like, I, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure what the solution to, to the timing challenge is. We can talk more about it. I mean, yeah. I, it, because 10 is obviously not at the beginning or the end of the day <laughs> or after hours, right? And so um, if folks want to revisit timing, we can do that. Um, but there's no uh, golden ticket, clearly. I just also wanted to say, um, Eric mentioned that uh, we've been having some or he, I should say, is <laughs> having some good conversations with a potential uh, main care member who's interested in the MAC. Um, if you uh, know of um, uh, members or a uh, parent, uh, a caregiver, guardian um, who uh, assists with a member or cares for a member, um, please, please let us know. Um, uh, we uh, one, the having direct voices are important, um, and two, uh, they're also required. So, uh, so we need at least um, a couple direct member representatives uh, as, as part of these conversations. So if you know folks and um, you want to introduce them, uh, we would be very grateful. Um, and Sarah Squires, uh, to your point, yes, compensation for uh, compensation is part of the plan for a member who is who is joining the MAC, that is, that will be happening. I will also note a, a lot of members don't work nine to five either. So like, again, they're like there's no perfect time, like after hours isn't after hours for someone who works evenings or um, and a lot of people have challenges earlier in the morning because of school drop off and things like that. So um, I'm happy to talk more about trying to find a time that might work better, but also I do think that there's like not a perfect time. And so part of it is finding people who can fit the time um, if we can. But I just want to come back to the, um, the appointments have been delayed. They're being, they're delayed for the reason of us trying to build more of what the Mac is, you know, legislatively supposed to be and organizationally main care wants member voice and member representation. And um, so that is the reason for the delays and um, appreciate your patience. Thank you. Um, so speaking of in the weeds things, uh, we're up to our rate system updates portion of the agenda. And usually we start with main care updates. Hey Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to um, do a high level update on the progress of rate studies that are already in progress. Um, we already discussed additional details with the rate subcommittee on the 24th. Um, and just so everybody knows, the detailed rate updates will be going to the subcommittee going forward. Um, so behavioral health providers have submitted comments and the vendor is, they have shared a summary of, they share a summary of those with us, which we're reviewing. For adult family care home and day health, the, you know, there will be a couple of notices going out this week to notify stakeholders of the date and time of the draft rate overview meeting, which will be, I believe, on the 17th, um, but you need to watch that notice. Make sure this is make sure I have that date right. Um, crisis services surveys have come in, and the vendor is analyzing those remote. Amanda, I'm sorry. Could you speak up a little? Because a, a couple people are having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, sorry. Do you want me to start over? I think so. Okay. So behavioral health rate studies uh, 13, 17, 28, 65, and 92. Can you hear me? That better. Yeah. Providers yeah. have submitted comments and our vendor has shared a summary with us, which we are reviewing. Adult family care home and day health providers, e-notices will be going out this week to notify stakeholders of an upcoming date and time of draft rate overview. Crisis services surveys have come in and Burns is analyzing those results. 
nursing facility and RCF, residential care facility, um, the RFP is closed and we are in the scoring process. Fairly qualified healthcare rebasing survey instrument is being revised for provider comments. Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinical Services. Uh, we're still working internally. Uh, and as Michelle noted, we're doing the stakeholder meetings. Family planning, a vendor has been selected and we're working on the contract. And section 23, new service, comprehensive health assessment. We're working on the rate model development and ident identifying dates for stakeholder engagement. Um, psychiatric residential treatment facility, um, internal planning and research is still ongoing. Hospital distinct psych detox unit, finalizing draft rate methodology for discussion with providers and working to identify dates for stakeholder engagement. And that's the update for in progress. Uh, there were a couple questions on the agenda for rate setting. Uh, the first one was the timeline for rate changes for behavioral health section. And um, January 1st is still the target date for behavioral health. Um, Maybe I'll just chime in there yeah. and say that um, uh, January 1st is still the target effective date. Um, given interplay between uh, noticing requirements and in some cases systems changes and in some cases question of uh, emergency authority for certain changes um, we're still uh, working on what may need to be retroactive versus what may be able to go live January 1. So uh, I acknowledge that it is getting quite late in the calendar year um, but uh, a lot of rate changes all at once and so um policy and rate setting are working as well as our configuration team are all working very hard to uh, get additional detail on what to expect on a service by service basis we will share that as soon as we are able thank you um the second question uh was cola changes for sections without rate changes do these go into effect on january 1st July 1st or some other timeline. So colors are given on July 1st or January 1st. And for the most part, if it's subject to quadruple A, they would receive the 1 1 cola. And if not, um, it would be 7 1. But we do plan to follow up and provide a, a table or a timeline that shows the policy by section and, and colas and when those would be. Any questions? Laura. Good morning. Thank you. Just uh, two questions on the follow up and timeline. Um, should we assume that in terms of the rates in terms of 13, 17, 28, 65, um, the many behavioral health as well as IDD service rates in there that we would um, have an update about which are retroactive and which would be in place um, in December? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, as well as the COLA update, would we expect to have that um, in December as well? Um, yes, and I uh, admit I got slightly distracted when Mandy was giving the COLA update. So Mandy, did you, the, did you say the piece about time the table with the COLAs? Like the or just kind of that generally speaking? Yes, uh, yeah. um, yes we, we can provide uh, more info with that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, but I, I, this may not cover every single instance, but once again, um, for services that received a 7-1 COLA, um, if you are getting uh, a broader rate update in January, then you're not going to get another, you're not going to get a COLA uh, uh, the next July one. You would, you would basically skip a July and then get a COLA the next year. Um, uh, if you got a COLA this past July 1 and, you, and the service is not otherwise getting a rate adjustment uh, during this fiscal year, then you would get another COLA on July 1. Um, 
Uh, so basically, the general rule is you get a COLA annually unless within the previous 12 months there has been um, a more substantive um, uh, rate update, rate determination process. Uh, and you can sub in January 1, where I said July 1, if, if you know you got a January 1 COLA, um, the same things apply that within the, the next year, if you had another rate adjustment, you wouldn't um, you wouldn't get a regular COLA. Um, and <laughs> the, sorry, this gets so complicated. But part quadruple A is uh, kind of an interesting twist on that because part quadruple A was the requirement that the labor component of rates equals at least 125% of minimum wage. Um, and so that is a January 1 requirement for, uh, for services. Uh, so um, services that are subject to part quadruple A um, uh, need to get that January 1 update, even if, uh, which uh, is a cost of living adjustment for a major component of the rate, uh, even if they've otherwise gotten an adjustment within the past year. Laura? Thanks. So, um, and I, I appreciate the complexity and the, the confusion that comes when talking about multiple rates with multiple timelines. Um, so thank you for walking through on the COLA. I, I'm just going to use section 13 as an example um, that's you know had a, a July 1 COLA. Is it anticipated that uh, those service rates um, with the current timeline of January 1 and July 1 for the respective COLAs would always be that moving forward? The January 1s I understand because of quadruple A, but the July 1, would those, all, let's say for section 13 on the year that it doesn't get an increase, would always be July 1 with the COLA going forward? I'm and not going to make a statement about always, um, just because like if there's a new law passed, it, 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 I guess, but, but Laura, maybe, I'm, maybe sorry. I'll ask it another way, Michelle. I'll, but, I'll just say, okay. there's is there a plan for the department to try to move uh, January uh, 1 colas to July 1 or July 1 colas to January no. 1? No, okay. there's not, Thanks. because it is actually to our advantage to try to have a bit of a division because doing all rate updates for everything um, on the same date every year is really operationally difficult. Um, okay. And so while we have heard, including internal to the department, that that might be nice from some perspectives, like just operationally, we can't really handle that. So, so we are trying to maintain a division of January 1 COLA updates versus July 1 COLA updates so that we can handle it. Um, and uh, so, uh, so our general preference and intent is that you kind of stay in your July 1 or your January 1 lane. Um, but that's where I can't make an always statement because other things happen, which might impact that, right? But our, our intent is to, to kind of keep it balanced so that we can make it through all the work and get those COLA adjustments um, out to providers uh, on an annual basis, uh, service by service. That's great. Okay, thanks so much. Mallory? Hi, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> I don't wanna add any more confusion to this conversation, but I'm still trying to sort out one, one piece of it. Um, so the, the wage component, <clears throat> if you're subject to the minimum wage increasing, you're saying that that will always be in January. So- If for part quadruple A specifically, if there is a service um, uh, that is part of the part quadruple A statute that you called out in that statute, that statute actually mentions uh, January adjustments to align with changes to minimum wage. So if you're if you're not part of the, the quadruple A, um, but you're getting wage adjustments, then, or is it only those that under quadruple A that are getting direct care wage adjustments? Um, so with our rate determination processes, generally speaking, um, we are, unless we are looking at a benchmark approach to Medicare, et cetera, if we are doing a rate study, we are always gonna look at the wage components, right? So looking at wage components is a very common thing. Uh, part quadruple A is where there are specific requirements around 125% for those wage components. So those are, those are two separate buckets. 
So the tie to the January, the January adjustment is for part quadruple A specifically. Uh, maybe I didn't get your question. Um, well, I, 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 my understanding is that some of the behavioral health direct care workers are subject to the wage, 125% wage rate changes, which should happen in January, but then they got their colas in July. So they would be getting both of those? A January yeah, so that, yeah I, I get your question, Mallory. So we gave a July COLA because it had been a while. They are subject to part quadruple A. So we're looking at one one effective dates. And then to your point, for those services, um, they because they are part quadruple A, they will uh, move to a January adjustment. Um, okay, so, so they'll be so getting I, a quadruple I, A wage adjustment in January, but their COLAs will continue to come on years that they haven't had a rate study in July. Yeah, I think, um, uh, so this is super complex and we have lots of conversations <laughs> around budget initiatives and everything else. It's like, there's so many different factors. Um, so I think we need a picture, which we will work on um, <laughs> a table. Um, but uh, I, I walked back when I initially said about July stays July, January stays January. That is our general preference. Oh. However, um, there are services where we did a July COLA because it had been a long time, but that are also part quadruple A. And for those mostly or all behavioral health services, we are going to switch to a January update for the whole kit and caboodle. So wage and non-wage COLA. Okay. Oh, okay. So just so I, just so I have this straight, because I know I'm going to be asked this. So the ones that had the July COLA last year that are getting the rate determination now, will probably not get a COLA next year. They will get one in, in 2024, but it will be in January along with the wage component. January, 2024. And you can definitively say that they will not be getting a July COLA. And and, and I know we just went through the rate thing, but will they get a, a wage adjustment January one, even though they're getting a new rate? That's the piece I'm not sure about. Well, the the wage adjustment is part of the rate. Okay, so that's just been built in. Okay, just yeah. wanted to make sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Michelle, I know you said that you're going to share a table where all of this is more clearly outlined. Um, there's also a request if someone could share the quadruple A statute link. Um, if someone can do that, that would be great. Yeah, if, uh, we should be able to do that during this meeting. Um, part quadruple A statute link, uh, yes. And I don't want to confuse things, and this is not my area of expertise, but just thinking about a lot of conversations that happened this past spring, is there any concern about whether the COLA increases that are supposed to happen in January, will, if they'll require additional appropriations in order to implement those in January, because I know last year they were higher than expected, so we had to wait until the legislature took action to be able to do those. Um, so I will say I'm not going to speak for. Um, I'll just make a factual statement that uh, as part of um, uh, LD 1867, which is now chapter. Yes, chapter 639, um, it does uh, state um, in that law that uh, there will be annual cost of living adjustments um, in years when there is not a rate study um, for services they are not benchmarked to other rates, um, and that chapter 639, 639, 639, um, also specifies that the Medicare Stabilization Fund may be used um, if there are insufficient uh, funds to cover those adjustments. That's a good reminder. So you could use the funds in that fund without having to wait for, say, a supplemental budget or, or a biennial budget to pass. That is what the law states. Okay. Thank you.
Any other questions before we move to the subcommittee updates? Okay, Laura, passing it to you. Okay, so the rate subcommittee met last Monday, the 24th of October, and uh, we welcomed um, members of the Office of Main Care Services uh, to present the rate determination schedule that went before the TAP, um, I think earlier in the month and uh, came out, I think, about a week or so ago. So I know folks have seen it. We um, walked through it, had a few questions. My thanks to folks at the department for um, their quick follow-up. Um, we then um, discussed um, the, you know, today's meeting and some um, upcoming uh, requests. Our next meeting is November 28th. It's the last Monday of the month. We uh, meet monthly, um, generally the fourth Monday of the month um, at 2 p.m. So November 28th at 2 p.m. And um, anybody is welcome. And we um, continue to think about ways that you know, we can especially appreciate the conversation and the effort um, that the department and folks in MAC are making to um, engage consumers and members of main care um, who are utilizing services as part of the discussion, but that's also part of what we've been uh, thinking about. So what is that, how do we, you know, make sure the uh, rate subcommittee um, is accessible to folks as well, um, especially as uh, rate studies and rate determination schedules in the future um, come forward. Um, so it was a good discussion. I look forward to continuing it uh, with the department um, and members at our November meeting. Um, Related to um, another item on the agenda today, um, folks did express concern about the uh, pending rounding rule that goes into effect January 1, and on behalf of the rate subcommittee wanted to uh, make a request. I don't know what will be shared today, but since this is my time um, in the report, I just would share that uh, we would like to see an extension if at all possible. We have um, lots of um, understaffed providers uh, who just have not been able to, as well as understaffed um, software um, vendors who just have not been able to uh, make changes and folks are worried about uh, complying on January 1st. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Laura, and everyone on that subcommittee. Um, so our next agenda item is updates from the dental subcommittee, which I also chair. So um, we haven't always done updates here because things were moving in lots of different ways, but did just want to share that there, um, the subcommittee is continuing to meet. Um, and for folks who are new, this subcommittee came together <clears throat> um, early last year. And then when the new adult dental benefit was um, became law, there were <clears throat> some requirements for the subcommittee to work with main care to help in the um, creation of the new benefit and to also think about things like the rates that were um, updated this summer as well. And that's been a really good partnership. But I did, uh, the subcommittee is continuing to meet to talk about um, related issues. So one of those being around um, workforce challenges, which I think we have talked about here in the MAC before as well, that, you know, it's, we have this really great new comprehensive benefit for adults. We already had a good benefit for kids. It's been strengthened. We've done this investment in rates, but there's also just, not enough providers for the people who need them in Maine. And so like, how can we um, address those challenges? So those conversations are gonna be continuing. They're happening in multiple spaces, but one of those is also this um, subcommittee. And that will definitely be the main topic at our next meeting. Um, and then at our last meeting in October, um, our focus was on the, um, there's a report requirement as part of the new law around the adult dental benefit, where we're supposed to look at um, various metrics around utilization of the benefit, um, provider enrollment, um, things like that. And so David Jorgensen, who's come to some of these meetings in the past, um, 
is the person at Main Care who's been leading that effort. He gave an overview of that report at our meeting two weeks ago. Maybe it was last week. Um, we didn't have our normal schedule this month because of the holiday. And um, we should have a final report that will, the report at this point gets us through the end of June, 2022. So we have like a level set of like, where were we when the dental benefit went into effect on July 1st? And then there'll be updates to that um, that will help us see like, are we making progress? How are things going? Where are there potential problems? And so that first report we should be getting very soon, I believe. Um, and as soon as that happens, I'll share it out with folks and it will be available online. So anybody who wants to look at it can. Um, so that's really where we are with the dental subcommittee. Um, I know a few folks too have reached out about provider enrollment and how to help support that. And um, the department is working to try to continue to connect with providers. And I know is planning to present at the Maine Dental Association Conference this year um, or summit. I'm not sure exactly what the event is, but there's an event coming up <laughs> where the department is going to present. And that will be another opportunity to try to help providers understand all the changes because there's a lot of confusion. Like some providers know that there's a benefit, but they didn't know that the rates had been changed. Some providers had heard that about the rates changes, but they didn't actually know exactly what they were. Or there was some confusion about like other things like prior authorizations or things like that. So um, I think there's still a lot of education for providers to help them understand the landscape so that they those who are not already accepting main care can make an informed decision about whether or not accepting main care is something that they could do, and that would really be helpful. Um, Beth? Um, I just recently had an issue come up from one of our practice about enrollment. Um, apparently, in, when there was a presentation a little while back, um, we were updated that it takes around two weeks or so, but apparently that has gotten quite further behind. Um, and unfortunately for this practice, this was a temporary provider that was going to help them increase their access, but the provider can't see main care patients if they can't be enrolled. Um, so I'm wondering if anybody has an update on the status of provider enrollment. Um, so generally speaking, uh, our provider enrollment performance has been uh, really good. I mean, that's a very general statement and has been, a, you know, vast improvement over where it was a few years ago. I can't speak to the status of any individual case. Um, so, and, and certainly some cases take longer than others for a whole, you know, for, for any number of reasons. Um, it could also be that, that, uh, that, that Gainwell had actually was missing some information and sent back requests to providers to, for more information. So I, I don't know if that's true in your case, but or the case you're speaking about, but that does sometimes happen. So my recommendation is to um, you can reach out to your provider relations specialist. Um, we also have a new provider enrollment manager. So uh, many of you may remember Aaron Fodder, who was our provider provider enrollment manager for a few years. He left Main Care uh, in the summer and. Um, and we've just a few weeks ago um, have someone new in the position. His name is Kenneth Jameson. So I can um, I can find his email address and, and put his email address in the chat. Uh, Molly, I, I do believe I encourage them to talk to their provider relations specialist to get their assistance. But I believe the feedback they had gotten from the Gainwell representative that they spoke to was that two weeks was the average time in the past, but it had increased. So. I'm not quite sure what that was about. And I knew that Aaron had left. So I thought possibly staffing changes might have been the reason why there had been some, uh, it was taking a bit longer than it had. Yeah, I'd say that even if it's, um, I, I want to say we're sort of in like the two to three week, um, around two to three weeks on average, which is still um, in the grand scheme of things, pretty fast. I, I recognize that for individual circumstances that that may not feel fast. Um, but I'm going to put uh, uh, Kenneth Jamison. He goes by KJ. Um, so I'm going to put KJ's contact information in the chat. And um, he could certainly look into um, the specifics of any individual case and whether there's anything that he can do to help move it along. Thank you for that update. Any other questions? I just wanted to follow up quickly on... Um... Kathy's point about the baseline dental report. Um, we 
uh, expect to have that up and on the main care website. I, I believe by the end of the week, we've had to make some additional tweaks. So um, it was our, uh, it should be up and I'll share that with Kathy once, once that's on the website. That's helpful, Eric. So I'll stop, I'll stop reaching out to David. <laughs> I'll give him a little break. Thank you. Um, and also thank you, Michelle, for sharing in the chat that there's not yet a new date around that prescribing provide, provider issue. Um, so that's helpful to know. Um, all right, we're definitely ahead of schedule today, uh, which is nice. So um, our next agenda item is a question which I think Esther Miller is going to answer around uh, enrollment. So for folks who are new, there was um, two new categories of coverage that were implemented on July 1st. Um, one was for people under 21 who would be eligible for, for main care, except that under federal law, their immigration status made them ineligible um, and the same for pregnant people. So those two coverage categories, regardless of immigration status, went into effect on July 1. And several of us were just wondering, um, what does that enrollment in those categories look like at this point? So Esther? Yeah, so we actually um, have a weekly report that tracks enrollment for the unborn child option in CHIP. And that number's floating pretty steadily, right around 65 on average. Um, certainly, there's some fluctuation. It's, it's at 69 today. Um, but that's been a pretty consistent population. The data team at OFI has not yet been able to add the FNQI population to that report, um, but we have that request with them. And as soon as they get that done, I'll be able to give you guys some enrollment counts on that group as well. I don't have those today. What is FN FNQI? Federally non-qualified individuals, that's the population of young individuals under the age of 21 who would be eligible for main care, but for their non-citizen status, they don't qualify. And can I, I'm sorry, Esther, can I also ask who are you reaching out to to make sure all of those kids know that they're now qualified? So OFI did an internal batch process with its known population to convert anyone who was, for example, um, open as an emergency services only case. And then that would have issued a notice of decision that would have gone to that household. Um, but separate from that, we don't have the staff available to provide like separate outreach to new clients. And let me let me pop in on that, um, Regina. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Esther's right. There, there's not st separate staffing, um, but as part of the um, federal health federal CDC health equity uh, grant that the state received, um, Maine Care is doing some targeted outreach uh, to try and communicate this. To this population that this is that this change has gone into place um, the contract for the media vendor um, is still in process um, but it's tied to uh, a lot of our um, to our public health emergency outreach so a lot of the same groups that are going to be doing um, a community-based outreach around the public health emergency will be getting information about the about the new coverage groups as well, um, and those organizations are the groups that were awarded the Office of Population Health Equities COVID Community Resilience Grant um, RFA. Uh, I think you, you're probably aware of that um, grant, Regina. Um, it's a number of community-based organizations. Uh, I think 15 in total. Um, they are. We're, we're still not sure who's going to be doing the public health emergency outreach from within that group, but that is the group that we are talking with in order to make sure we reach appropriate communities. Um, so there is a strategy to do some outreach as connected to the to that time limited grant. It's not um, it's not a you know when the grant expires, our outreach dollars for that will have expired, but we will have at least 
communicated this change and have gotten the word out broadly that main care does accept, uh, uh, does have coverage options for this population. And can we make sure that we include in those conversations those, uh, oh, sorry, it's specific to the population of the immigrant community. Sorry. Thank you, Eric. Yep, yep. exactly. It's, it is a, it's a, it's a narrow field. Um, yeah. Yep. So I guess, my, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, Go no, ahead. no. Okay. I'll, I'll, if I have any questions, I'll, I'll just reach out to Eric. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, don't be sorry. Um, those are great questions. Um, Esther, I do have just two more questions. Sorry. One is, so the 65, about 65 per week that you're saying for the pregnancy category, um, is that, is there a way to know like the total number of people who've enrolled? You know, like I assume some of those people have since lost coverage because their pregnancy ended. So is there a way to know like how many total have enrolled in the new category? Um, yep, I can get a distinct list of individuals, but I can't promise how long that will take. Okay, well, that would be great. Um, and the dashboard that you said where those numbers are available right now, is that just the norm? Like, is that, where is that on the website? Um, uh, um, I don't even know that these populations are reflected in the dashboard oh. yet. So um, <laughs> I have a report that comes to me straight from our data team. That's, okay. that's not a public facing um, document or reporting process. Okay, that's helpful. So maybe periodically we can just keep checking in about that here since there's not a public space to get that. Thank you. Any other questions? Happy, um, I can go back if, if you can give me a few minutes um, as we move on to the next agenda items. I do have um, from a few back from when we implemented the two new eligibility groups, some numbers around how many people uh, converted at that time. So that would be people who, as Esther was saying earlier, would have had emergency services only coverage and, and OFI automatically converted them to the new coverage group. So that is gonna be a few months old, but, uh, but, I can, um, but, but I can take a look while we move on to the next agenda item. That would be great. Thank you, Molly. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing a question in the chat from Jillian about the new rate prioritization timeline. I, I'm not sure I know what the question, I, I think that that's what was discussed at the rate subcommittee, but maybe I'm mistaken about that. I think that's right, Kathy. So I think it's um, talking about the annual rate determination schedule that we need to release and that we had a public forum last Wednesday, um, the rate subcommittee discussed Monday and comments on that are due. Is that right? Yeah, the ninth. Comments, um, comments regarding the schedule are due on November 9th or by November 9th. And is there a, is there something for the people who might want to make comments on that? Where would they look for that to respond to? Yeah, we will put the website. There's now an easy URL. Um, so we'll put that website in the chat and all the information is there. Great, thank you. Jillian, did that get to your question? I was seeing Jillian on my screen before, but now I don't see her. So hopefully it got to her question, but ask. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I was just I was just looking at the draft. I was on that uh, the call she was discussing, but I hadn't seen the rate redetermination scheduled prior to the meeting. It's the first that I've actually heard that there was consideration of reprioritizing some of the rates. So I was kind of surprised. Um, but during this meeting, I pulled a link that you put there for something else and found the redetermination link. And um, I'm I'm guessing that's open to public comment right now, and maybe can't have. Um, a discussion about it. Is that correct? I'm specifically looking yeah. at your new recommendations to reprioritize sections that may have been overlooked during the planning process of critically underfunded services. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if I'm quite on the same page with how you're characterizing this, Jillian, but I will say that um, 
Uh, this is not part of the APA process, so we are free to talk about um, uh, feedback regarding our proposed rate determination schedule. So I'll defer to Kathy um, uh, on that topic, but uh, nothing is prohibiting us from hearing feedback. And I just want to note, Jenny did uh, share a link but that's not the friendly link in case you're like, that is not a friendly URL. You're right, that's not a friendly URL, but there is one that I'm putting in the chat, uh, which redirects uh, to what Jenny put there. It's already in there. Yep, it's Eric already and I jinxed. We, Eric, right. Eric got the right link. So thanks, Eric. <laughs> we're scrambling over here. So, okay, thanks. I mean, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So if there's something, Jillian, that you want to lift up now, we have a little bit of time. No, I would. I, to be honest, I was happy uh, to see this recommendation of the other department schedule recommendations because I think you guys know I've been I advocated pretty heavy throughout the pandemic to try to save nursing services because they were critically underfunded and I had to discharge um, hundreds of clients because it, we were you know we were excessively losing revenue during the pandemic just due to forced mandates and and you know risks of people in that age population that are serving clients and their inability to work. Um, so I was happy to see that you reprioritize the section 19 and 96 nursing, because I don't think that would have waited five years from the original date that um, nursing was looked at. I, I think it was overlooked is what I'm saying. And, you know, I'm just glad to hear you guys that have that on the top of your list because um, it was unfortunate that we had to close those services. Thanks, Jillian. And, um, uh, and yes, we did have explicit conversation about what has been happening um, specifically with the nursing uh, workforce within the, the last couple of years. And, and just so everybody, I, I think when you're talking about reprioritization, you might be referencing what was initially recommended as part of the rate system evaluation. Is that correct? Um, I yeah. See. So, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm looking at your 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 draft here, and yes. Yeah, so when you originally put on a timeline for nursing, it seemed as though the department had the perception that section 19 and 96 were already fully funded. We're good. Let's wait five years. And I've been pretty. Even though I closed my nursing services, I've been very heavily advocating for that's not accurate. All those services weren't funded. It was just PSS. It was never nursing or LPN. Um, so on your prioritization schedule, it, it wasn't even a priority on the schedule. I couldn't even get a date when it might be looked at. So, so anybody that was crunching the numbers on the survivability of that program is like, whoa, this, you know, we don't have much time left, right? Which is why I closed it. But when you submitted the draft of, it was on that link that somebody just posted it, of your, of you know, your main care review of upcoming changes. And the last bullet under the draft was other department schedule recommendation CY23. And I see you recommended to, um, to reprioritize nursing. Uh, so, it, so it actually is potentially gonna be on the schedule. I, I think that would, very much prevent a, a crisis of those services because I, we provided that service for 28 years and it was just devastating for us to not be able to partner with the community anymore on that. So I'm just happy for other agencies. I'm not saying that I would get back into it at this point because it was it was overwhelming. And I think, you know, once you close something, it's hard to bring it back. But um, I, I appreciate that you guys rescheduled it because it is it is a critically unmet need. Thanks, Jillian. And, um, Did I answer your question now? But yes, it's right at the beginning yeah, yeah, of your whole, yeah, you've got it all bulleted. This is on schedule. This, And then at the bottom, I just really appreciate, like community paramedicine, you put that down there in that bullet too. So I think it's just helpful for companies that are strategizing for their up years, but their next year's budget, right? Because you have to have like minimum wage. You've got to know what you're going to start to paying. And then in there, you've got to know, are you know, are, are, is this program going to survive? Um, so you know, I think it would give other nursing agencies some hope that they um, that they'll survive while they're planning here. I think it's um, it could go in the communication side of things, but like 
one, we're trying to get this website up and running so it's an ongoing resource um, for folks to look at and be able to kind of have those references like you're talking about, Jillian. But also, I just want to you know lift up the rate setting subcommittee as an excellent opportunity to really get into these conversations. Um, we had a small group um, in the conversation this month, but like for providers who are really thinking about rates and how those impact, uh, you know, finding the opportunities to comment on schedule and like really give feedback that that subcommittee is a good opportunity um, to, to really chime in. And to that point, Eric and Laura, you may have said this and I missed it. Um, is there a way that folks, it will, will the department be like letting the subcommittee know in advance, like what topics might need to be covered so that we could then let the whole MAC know in case there's people who aren't regularly a part of that subcommittee, but who might have expertise in a certain area, they might wanna prioritize going to certain meetings. I would flip that around a little bit, Kathy, and I think it might be helpful to have more of a discussion on this point, but um, while it is absolutely uh, our responsibility to provide the updates on everything that is going on uh, in relation to our plan and make sure that that is clear and that there's links and that there's information, um, in terms of we are really going to look to the rate subcommittee to say, this is what we want to hear more about. This is uh, where we want discussion from the department. So I don't think it will be difficult. Mandy can kick me under the table if her legs are long. Um, <laughs> to kind of have sort of the general update of, all right, this is our schedule and these are the rate determination notices that have gone out. And for each of these, for each of these, um, Rate determinations. This is the current. Um, this is the current status. Like that's information we have. If it's helpful for us to talk through that at meetings, we can do that. Uh, but in terms of a desire for, um, you know, delving in on a specific topic, or there's this other question that's not actually answered through the website. Like we are going to look to the rate subcommittee to um, for direction on what you need from us. So we, we don't have the, we haven't had the intention, and if you look at the language in the, in the statute, um, uh, we don't see ourselves as being the driver of the agendas for the rate set, uh, subcommittee. Like, obviously, we need to provide the information of what is happening and, and make sure that everything is clear, but uh, the agenda should come from the subcommittee. And to speak a little bit about, you know, kind of our next steps with the subcommittee, we recognize the website currently is bare bones and needs to be built out more so that uh, the subcommittee has the information they need to ask for more information, right? Like um, this is, this is a, a new process for all of us involved and figuring out how to build that in a way where, you know, the subcommittee's expectations and, uh, and main care meeting those expectations occur in a way that everyone's happy with, uh, it's going to take a little practice, right? Um, we're not necessarily there yet. Our aim for the next subcommittee meeting is to go with a next draft of the website um, because we want this website to be an ongoing um, resource um, that, that folks who are MAC members or providers in general who might join the subcommittee can say, ah, okay, I, I found what I need. Here's what I need from you, Main Care, outside of what you have on the website, and can ask for that, and can do what Michelle's saying, where like specific asks and specific directions are coming to us uh, because we've, as Main Care, because we've provided enough information for you all to to make those questions. Um, but I think that the, you know, the to Jillian's point um, or mine and Jillian's point the participation and how providers engage in that subcommittee will be critical to that. Um, Laura, do you have any thoughts about that that you want to share? And it's okay if you don't. I didn't mean to put you on No, I, I do. I appreciate Michelle and Eric's comments. And I, I really see it the same way that folks would be bringing 
um, that members of the MAC and members of the um, public or providers that don't serve on the MAC or aren't represented in um, some way are, um, you know, looking for, at main care notices, coming to the page that's um, being developed and finding uh, relevant information and with concern um, or questions, you know, maybe it's going to the department and they're pushing it to the rate subcommittee or maybe it's going to both um, and that those meetings are, you know, well posted and um, both in this space and publicly um, that folks are encouraged to bring their um, questions or recommendations there as well. Great, thank and, you. Uh, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to come across as too harsh. I mean, obviously, we're happy to collaborate. So, if you know, um, Laura or whoever from the Rate Setting Subcommittee says this is a proposed agenda, then um, we are happy to uh, weigh in and discuss and finalize that together, just like we do for MAC meetings right now, to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of what we're able to uh, present on uh, and go into more depth on. Thank you. And Laura, maybe you and I can follow up and just think about how to better let the rest of the MAC know about those topics in case people who are not regularly a part of the meeting. Not sure. Know. And um, however, we can do more robust updates um, in this meeting, um, not uh, take not uh, adding to it, because I know we're trying to take away from the um, getting in the weeds uh, about rates, but maybe there's a way of uh, a streamlining of those reports um, and getting feedback from MAC members at large about how to do that. Thanks. Yeah, that'd be great. And if anyone else has thoughts about that, feel free to reach out. Just, just real quick. I mean, if you're a provider concerned about rates, um, that might be a more valuable meeting than these meetings. Just like really, um, if if we're getting, if we're diving into rate rate setting and, and it's gonna shift and it's gonna change, but just wanna flag that for folks, if they're if you're on limited time and really thinking about it, um, that it, it would be great to move those conversations in depth into that space. Yeah. And for those of you who are here, who are not MAC members, um, just a reminder too, that you don't need to be a MAC member to be on a subcommittee either. So others, can join uh, the dental subcommittee, for example, has a lot of folks who are not actually MAC members um, who've regularly been attending. So um, the same is true for the other subcommittee. All right, so let's move on to our next topic, which is um, implementation of the new rounding rule. Um, and Henry, I think you're taking the lead there. And Kathy, this is Jenny. I'm going to just jump in to introduce Henry and to introduce the topic. And so for those of you who don't remember, um, the rounding rule is part of chapter one, section one, which is the section of main care policy that applies to all providers. And so as we were readopting that rule, which is Henry's section of policy, he's the policy writer for that section. We had a number of conversations with the MAC and with MAC members just trying to understand some of what we were hearing around constraints around rounding. And I think the upshot, we did adopt the rule in the end of May. And as a result of the conversations that we've had, we delayed implementation of that rule, rule to January 1st, 2023, which is now rapidly approaching. So it's definitely timely to have it on the agenda right now, just for us to make sure that we are prepared and that our provider relation folks are prepared to answer questions as that implementation deadline approaches. So Henry is here to talk through the approach in the rule. And then we also have Tia Balduck from the PR team and we'll take any comments and questions that we get back so that we can make sure that we are prepared to assist providers as they, as they make the change. Um, so let me turn it over to Henry. And again, we're happy to hear input from folks and questions. Great, thanks, Jenny. I'll just give a brief overview because I think a lot of you are familiar. Um, but on May 29th, Main Care adopted a Chapter One, Section One rulemaking uh, that made changes to the rounding rule. The previous rule directed providers to round up and down based on a 50% benchmark and did not allow for billing of partial units. The new rounding rule increases that rounding benchmark to 80% of a unit. Um, and allows for partial billing to either one or two decimal places. 
The new provision also allows um, the provider to use the original 50% benchmark in cases where an unforeseen or uncontrollable circumstance prevents the provider from de delivering the whole unit, um, such as the power outage. Um, and as Jenny said, we did receive a number of comments during rulemaking that expressed concerns about implementing um, the proposed rounding rule. And we adopted this provision with a 1123 effective date to give providers time to make the necessary changes. Um, I know that's a brief overview. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions to the best of my ability. Pete? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I have a question about, about the rounding rule. I, I've been working with our vendor trying to uh, get it implemented. And the way it's written, there's some confusing or vague variables that, that I, they can't quite understand and, and, and neither can I really. And, and, and the part of the timeliness is, is getting that work done. And if they don't clearly understand it, it it's hard to, to program it. And, and an example would be the 80% is quite clear. You know, the 50% to 80% range, I think is clear, you know, when, when you read the first part of the rule, but then when you get to the next part, it says, gets into unforeseen circumstances like, like Henry alluded to. So, so, so I'm unclear if you're at say 60%, do you need to document a, a, a uh, unforeseen circumstance to be able to bill at 60% or is that only to get to 100%? And, and then thirdly, you know, what if you do 40%? We have some services that are an hour unit, uh, you know, in day treatment. So if a little kid can only have 20 minutes of care for whatever reason, can we even build? We need an unforeseen circumstance for that uh, for for that issue, and 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 if it's less than fifty percent, so so there's a little bit of, of vagueness or unclarity from 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 working with our vendor, and and I don't know how to best understand that. Uh, yeah, I can I can um, at least try to make it more clear right now. The unforeseen and uncontrollable circumstance. Um, if you uh, that if you if you have delivered sixty percent of a service, and an an unforeseen or uncontrollable circumstance happens, in that case you can document that circumstance and round up to the full unit. You don't need an uncontrollable or unforeseen circumstance to happen in order to bill. 0.6 of a unit okay. if you chose to do that. You can always bill partial units. What if your partial unit is less than 50%? Let's say it's 20 minutes out of a 60 minute uh, unit of service. It's easier when there's 15 yeah. minute units, but but these longer units, are, that was one of my suggestions. Can we make that a 15 minute unit? But, you know, I don't see that happening. Uh, even in yeah. age setting, I asked for that. But uh, could you address that? You know, like it's a 30%? What, what would yeah. You can, so if, I mean, if you're delivering, if the, we do ask that you bill in the smallest unit possible, but if that unit is an hour and you deliver 20 minutes, um, you, you can bill, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.33 um, to represent one third of a service delivered. Without an unforeseen circumstance. That's correct. Okay. Now, I, I hope provider integrity use it the same way you do, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of times, two years down the road, they're reading this and they're trying to, they don't have this opportunity to get feedback from, from you, which, which I wish they did. Yeah, but, so the, this, this change was driven um, from program integrity and they had a lot of, um, I mean, they, they had uh, full input on, on this rule and how it was written. Sure. So yeah, okay. they're, they're aware. Okay, so uh, then I I can with clarity explain that to our, our programmer. It's it's uh, you know it just makes it harder for them to, especially with sixty minute units. It's harder to program that many variables. Yeah. Uh, but uh, thanks, thanks, Henry. Yeah, I may make some comments anyway, just in writing, just for for uh, you know for the record. But thank you.
Yeah. And uh, anyone can reach out to me. Some people already have just asking for clarity and um, I should put my email in the chat, but um, I'll do that and um, definitely feel free to reach out. Mallory? Hi. Um, given it's not just Pete, but, but across the board, um, troubles with working with the, um, you know, um, programmers in the EHR and whatnot to try to redo this, um, is there any possibility of getting a further extension? I know that many of our providers are, are running into trouble with redoing their system to meet this and have been working at it for months, but um, con continuing to have trouble in, in setting that up. Uh, in, internally, I know we, we have not discussed a further extension. Um, I don't know if Jenny or Michelle wants to weigh in, but we did, you know, we, we did implement this rule with the future effective date to give an adequate amount of time that we felt. Um, but yep, I don't think we have an answer to that question right yeah. now, Mallory, but we certainly do want providers to be working with our provider relations unit. And if there's difficulties that are arising, let's start the communications as soon as we can. Um, and that's also partly why we're happy to be discussing this topic right now, just so that the PRs are aware that this is coming down the pike. Okay, I, so I they should just, sorry, they should keep contacting their, their PRs and uh, letting them know when they're running into trouble and and we can, like, do we need to officially request there be a consideration of an extension or? <clears throat> Um, uh, I guess we can we can take this back internally and just discuss. I definitely I, I don't think we can uh, comfortably promise anything, but um, I, I will say you can always bill, you know, deliver and bill full units and not run into any um, uh, not con not conflict with this provision. You can also submit claims on the Health Pass portal, uh, and that does accept partial units. Um, if you know, providers are really having trouble and they want to do that. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Henry. You're welcome. Um, so let's move on to our next agenda item, and that is the rulemaking section, and I'll pass it to you, Jenny. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so the rulemaking <coughs> update was attached to Kathy's uh, email with the agenda, so if anyone doesn't have it and needs it, then please reach out to me and or Kathy, and we can get you a copy. Um, so we do have two open comment periods right now. One is for the 1915K community first community first choice state plan option. And so this is a state plan option that expands opportunities for the provision of home and community-based long-term services and supports that facilitate community integration and expand access to opportunities for main care members to select and receive services with an emphasis on self-directed supports and again for state plan services in particular. So the comment period on that state plan option ends on November 23rd, 2022. And further information is in the rulemaking summary document on how to submit those comments. The other open comment period, actually it's not in the attachment. I talked about it at our last meeting. Um, that is the comment period on our non-emergency transport waiver renewal. That comment period closes on November 4th. And Lisa Weaver, who is on this call, is the contact person for um, any comments on that waiver renewal. Again, not a lot of changes to that waiver renewal. Um, it's the waiver that enables us to use a brokerage system in providing non-emergency transportation services. So in terms of other rulemaking updates, 
We do have two rules that were adopted since the last written update. One is section 45, the hospital services rule. That rule took effect on October 24th. And then section 25, dental services, I think had already taken effect when we met last time that took effect on September 28th. And, um, but it was not yet officially noticed when we put together the rulemaking packet. Um, so going forward, just to flag a few of the rules that will be coming shortly, Section 65, Behavioral Health Services, we're expecting to adopt a final rule very soon. Um, we're also expecting to move forward with our COVID emergency rule. That's the rule that encapsulates all of the COVID flexibilities that were implemented during the public health emergency. And so with the potential that the public health emergency will be ending in January, we are looking to get that adopted. Um, another important rule is the school health services rule. So we're working to finalize that rule for proposal and to consult with DOE and to have some further stakeholder engagement on that rule. And then the remaining rulemakings, um, I won't get into in detail, but there are many rulemakings associated with our implementation of the rate system reforms that we talked about earlier. So that's my quick update and I'm always happy to answer questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much. Um, next up is communications updates, Eric. I've just got two kind of quick ones um, and both have been mentioned already. Um, the, as Michelle mentioned, public health uh, emergency unwinding we're expecting to hear uh, around November 11th, um, which of course is a holiday, uh, or around November 12th, which is a weekend, the Friday before is a holiday. Um, so somewhere in the 10th to 14th, um, we expect to hear um, our 60 day notice in the event that that occurs. Um, we have been making some plans uh, to do, I know many main care uh, many MAC members were at the um, at the public forum that we held uh, regarding the public health emergency. Um, we've been making plans for if if the end of the public health emergency happens uh, is announced that there will be another similar um, uh, gathering so that people can get the latest information shortly thereafter. Um, so just uh, we will be following up if that 60 day notice comes um, and so be ready. Cause I think that's gonna be big on all of our agendas um, if when, when that happens. Um, and then the other point is attached to the rate setting website. Uh, again, I, I, can, I can pop the website in, uh, in the chat again. Um, we are working on developing that rate reform website. We want the right information out there for providers to be, to have the information they need in order to give feedback to main care, to know when, when their, you know, their sections of policy are going to be up for a determination, that sort of thing. Um, it's our plan. We're, we're working on kind of a next draft of the website and it's our hope to share that with the rate setting subcommittee. Um, and as folks know, you don't have to be a MAC member to be a subcommittee member, um, you know, it's going to be a place where where you can help us build the tools you all need, so that you are getting the communication you want from the state. Um, so I encourage you, uh, Laura. Did you say it was the twenty eighth uh, of November? Oh, yep, it's the fourth Monday of the month at two p.m. Monday, November twenty eighth. Yeah. Um, just want to flag that again, um, that we're going to be there talking about the website because uh, communication about this whole rate reform process is going to be critical in order to make sure that providers can give the feedback that we need in order to give the rates that work for you all to continue providing service. So um, just want to flag both of those things as important and upcoming in the next month. Any questions?
Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, so that was our agenda. And I, aside from knowing that we'll probably have an update about the public health emergency, um, I didn't hear any new agenda items. So we have certain standing agenda items, including the updates from main care, the check-in on rates system stuff. Um, uh, we'll probably have an update from the dental subcommittee, I think. Um, we'll have rulemaking always. And did I say communications already? <laughs> Those are all ongoing, like on the agenda each time. Um, I didn't hear any other new agenda items, but if there's something I missed, please flag it for me. M Mallory? Yeah, I just noticed that on the on the minutes or on the, the agenda, it says the next meeting is November 6th. I believe. <laughs> I think that's it's supposed to be December. <laughs> that's what I thought. Just is that, right? is that not Tuesday? What did, where did I get that date from? We just like each other so much. We'll be right back. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I'm so sorry. I'll make sure I send out a thing today to just correct that. Sorry. Uh, that's what I get for reusing old agendas when I try to make the new one. Um, yeah. And also folks should have noticed that um, if you're if you're on the list to get updates about the Mac, um, and if you're not and you want to be, let me know and we can make sure you're on it. Um, that Lisa Weaver at Main Care did send um, calendar holds for potential snow days in December, January, and February. So those holds are on the second Tuesday of the month at the same time. Um, and just a reminder that if if there is a weather event or some other thing that causes state government to be closed, then we cancel the MAC because um, obviously we have a lot of folks from state government involved. And it also probably means that a lot of the rest of us have other things disrupting our schedules. Um, so there is always the possibility that, that we're moving into winter and that could happen, but otherwise we'll be meeting on December 6th, December, not November. Thanks, Mallory. Any other questions or notes? <laughs> okay, great. Well, have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye.